Hey, it's Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. And today we're going to talk about a global flood, Adam and Eve, the age of the earth. No, nope, not talking about any of that. We're going to talk about Joseph. We're talking about Joseph's global famine. That's right. The famine that covered the entire world. And people had to come from the ends of the earth in order to come to Egypt to get grain from the storehouses that Joseph had stored up in order to save the entire world. Yes, it's the recapitulation of Noah's flood in Joseph's time. Why is no one talking about this? Let's go look at the answers from Genesis and learn how we can reclaim biblical authority about Joseph's global famine. The year, the year was 1700 BC. Oh, wait, before I begin, I really do have to admit something up front because I don't want there to be any confusion. And I'm not trying to lead people astray, especially those who may not finish this video, right? You got 10 minutes into it and you abandon it and you wonder like, what in the world was Joel Duff talking about this time? So here's my caveat about everything I'm gonna say after this. This is a piece of satire. It's a piece of serious satire in that I have a very distinct point that I wanna make. It's a point about biblical interpretation. So keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about reclaiming the biblical authority of Joseph's global famine. All right, let's begin again. The year was 1700 BC. Severe climate change. Yeah, it had been engulfing the entire earth for several years. People were coming from every corner of the globe. They were traveling to Egypt to buy grain, which Joseph had stored up as a result of his vision that God had given to Pharaoh nearly a decade before. During this time, no field had been plowed right? No field had been harvested. Why? Because the rain had been held in check in order for Joseph, who's an archetype of Christ, could provide salvation to all the people of the earth. In particular, Jacob, who's now called Israel, would find temporary refuge in Egypt through God's provision of Jacob's son, Joseph. Let's face it, today, a literal seven-day creation, the Garden of Eden, Noah's flood. Hey, they get all the attention when it comes to globally transformative events in Earth's history. Sadly, Joseph's global famine, recorded for us in Genesis 41, has long been overlooked, or I would even say dismissed by many biblical scholars and scientists. Because of his miraculous ability to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, Joseph was able to put into action a plan that saved countless thousands from starvation. However, while Noah saved the entire human race from extinction, during the planet-wide flood, the famine of Joseph has often been relegated to a mere, what, a, just a local event. But surely, since every verse of the Bible is inerrant in every detail, including all aspects related to what, biology, geology, and meteorology, the plain meaning of the account of Joseph saving the entire world from starvation needs to be properly told and vigorously defended, as I am going to do here. To deny this eyewitness testimony of global catastrophe is tantamount to denying the global flood and will of, will, of course, inextricably lead to the denial of the resurrection of Christ. To suggest that the famine was other than planet-wide is to compromise the very authority of Scripture. The Bible is clear. A catastrophe of global proportion occurred around 3,700 years ago. This global catastrophe recorded to us in Genesis 41 was neither by flood, as it was in Noah's day, nor by fire, which is reserved for the final destruction of the earth, 2 Peter 3.10, but instead resulted from rain being withheld from the earth. That rain would normally have flooded the Nile, bringing life-sustaining nutrients into the farmlands of Egypt. That rain would also have normally watered the fields of Canaan, the pastures of southwest North America, and the rice paddies of Asia. Now, this historical fact, which is plainly revealed in God's word, can be found in Genesis 41 and specifically verses 56 and 57, which read, So when the famine had spread to all the land, Eretz in Hebrew, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land, Eretz, of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all of what? The earth. Eretz, same word used in Genesis, earlier to early chapters of Genesis. The same word used in the early chapters of Genesis. Notice that even the very well, liberal ESV scholars responsible for this, we'll call it less than literal translation, 
they couldn't deny the authors, right? Moses' intent regarding the scope of this tremendous catastrophe, right? All of what? The earth, the entire globe came to Egypt. And the famine was what? It was severe over where? Over the entire earth, over all the earth. However, they still try to subvert the text. Why? How do they do that? What does the ESV do? Well, look what they did. They translated Eretz as the land, right? At the beginning of, of verse 56. And then the same word is translated earth later in the same verse, showing that they're trying to cover, up, cover over the fact that this is a worldwide event. Now, the translators of hey, the good old King James Version Hey, they weren't as biased by modern worldly science and evolution, right? How did they translate Genesis 41, 56 accurately? Well, they said, and the famine was over all the face of the earth, right? It should not escape our notice that these are the exact same Hebrew words used in Genesis 1, 2, which describe the original state of the whole creation, wherein the spirit hovered over what? Over the face of the deep. The global intent of the phrase, the face of the earth from the creation account is also implicit in, yeah, yet another global event that you're very familiar with, Noah's flood. In Genesis 8, we find multiple uses of the same phrase. For example, in reference to Noah's flood, Genesis 8, 9, in the King James Version states, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Again, using that same word, Eretz, used to be, which is used to describe what? the scope of what we just saw, Joseph's famine. Clearly, the author's intention was to explain that the entire planet was completely underwater at the time of Noah. Similarly, we can see that the plain reading of the authoritative word of God absolutely requires that this severe famine causing neither plowing nor harvest, Genesis 45, 6, that must have covered the entire planet Earth. Even though God's eyewitness testimony should be enough for us to believe this historical fact, he has further blessed us with confirming physical evidence of this worldwide calamity, leaving no excuse, Romans 1.20, for the denial of this dramatic global event, right? Based on that clear description of real historical events, it's quite rational to conclude that one should expect to find evidence today of devastating global famine in historical records and its physical effects on the surface of the, of the earth. And indeed, this is exactly what we find. Observational evidence and historical records from around the world attest to a global famine around the year 1700 BC. Now, for time's sake, we're simply gonna limit ourselves to just a few of the many, many examples that we could bring to bear on this question. The respected website, Ancient Patriarchs, they report that research shows that the Chinese emperor Cheng Tang recorded a seven-year famine from 1704 to 1697 BC, which directly overlaps possible dates of Joseph's famine. Civilizations such as the Olmecs, who migrated from the Yucatan Peninsula in 17 BC, invented plumbing, demonstrating a sudden need and interest in water conservation, obviously in a land that usually wasn't lacking water. Other civilizations, such as South American peoples who had originated around 1700 BC, established their kingdom in what today is known as Bolivia. The high migration, the really high volume of migration attests to a time when food supplies were waning and people were moving around trying to obviously trying to find new sources of food, not realizing that the entire world must have been engulfed in this severe famine as well. Lastly, echoes of advances, first made by the Egyptians in other parts of the world, are direct testimony to the fact that people from the entire face of the earth must have come to Egypt at this time to find food. These people who came and found food also witnessed Egyptian culture. They took certain aspects back to their homes once the famine had ended. For example, consider the Mesoamerican pyramids in South and Central America and their fondness for cats, right, in North America. Hey, Egyptians like cats, all of a sudden people in other parts of the world, they like cats too. These are both very clear evidences, visible even today, of the planet-wide famine of 1700 BC. So why? Why the global famine? Just like we might ask, why a global flood? 
God had a purpose behind it. God used Joseph's famine for the good, if not just for Israel, but for all of earth's inhabitants. What do we know? We know that the Bible is accurate in every single detail, and this helps us to understand that this global famine attests to the extreme global warming event brought only by God, similar to how Job's life attests to the reality of a single wet ice age that followed the global Noahic flood. The ice age was an after effect of the global flood, but such an icy world would have presented problems for future generations. Similarly, the famine caused by global warming and lack of precipitation precipitation, though it was a great blessing since it reshaped our physical world, it was also a judgment on the people of the world at the same time. We propose that the seven-year famine was used by God to quickly remove the vast ice fields that covered the land, like nearly the entire planet at that time. The massive melting would have caused the formation of the astounding Grand Canyon, the Niagara Falls, Yosemite Valley, and many other erosional features of the earth, including large deltas, that would have become valuable agricultural land in the future. Through God's gracious provision, people could now spread across the world into regions previously made uninhabitable by the ice caused by Noah's flood. Since we have abundant evidence of a worldwide famine, we can ask what might have caused such an effect. Of course, God is the primary cause. But just like in Noah's day, he might have used secondary causes. Like nat which are natural mechanisms to achieve his purposes. For example, to initiate the flood, an asteroid of a passing planet might have been providentially timed to pull on structural weaknesses of the Earth, placed there during the creation in the anticipation of this future event, causing the storehouses of water below and, the surface, uh, and below the surface to be released. For the famine of Joseph, likewise, we propose a second interloping planet pass close by the earth, causing a disturbance in the axis of the earth, causing more extreme weather patterns for several years. Our omniscient God, knowing the position of every object in the solar system, set the object on its trajectory years prior in anticipation of this particular event, likely during the actual creation itself. God related to Pharaoh a vision, gave Joseph the insight to properly interpret that vision, thus preserving Israel and the seed of Abraham. Now, it's worth noting here that this is, what is this that we're describing? We're describing the real global climate change, right? And it's recorded for us right here in the Bible. Today, our politicians and even some of our church leaders look to changes in polar ice caps, increasing carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere, and worry about climate change, but ignore and belittle climate change that has caused massive famines throughout the world just 3,700 years ago. We deny real global catastrophes while gnashing our teeth over minor little tiny blips and temperature changes that might take decades and might not have a lasting impact. Bottom line though is, this is a biblical authority issue. This is ultimately about the authority of God's word, which plainly teaches that the famine of Joseph was global in extent. Indeed, if the text of Genesis 41 clearly teaches, and it does, that the famine of 1700 BC was global and we reject that teaching. We are undermining the reliability of the authority of other parts of scripture, including John 3, 16. God's word is trustworthy and authoritative in all that it affirms. These and many more biblical and theological and scientific considerations make the compromise of a mere local famine so often promoted by liberal seminary professors totally untenable. This is all ultimately about the authority of all of God's word, which plainly teaches the famine of Joseph was global in extent. Look, we all have the same data. It's really a question of the worldview that we interpret that data through. And when viewed with the right worldview glasses, the biblical and scientific evidence, they support a global famine. It's time to recognize that defending the historicity of one of the most profound events that has ever taken place in Earth's history, no less than the biblical authority of God's word is at stake. Okay, now I recognize it's always dangerous to satirize scripture, right? Especially you know, by a Christian. It sounds kind of flippant. It sounds irreverent. And I don't mean to be irreverent. I'm simply trying to make a point about biblical hermeneutics, interpretation of texts. 
right? And improper, obviously improper interpretations of texts, right? This is a work of satire, but it doesn't mean that I'm promoting some sort of mythological view of Joseph, like some or some low view of biblical authority, despite what I'm talking, what I'm saying in my satire about biblical authority. I do believe Joseph was a real person and he was in history and there was a severe famine, all those things that record in scripture. That said, I don't believe that biblical exegesis requires that the famine be global in extent and that peoples that are literally came from the whole earth came to Egypt, that people traveled from South America all the way to Egypt to pick up grain in order to save uh, that part of the world. Those that promote such literal interpretations of words used to describe the scope of events or the length of days must understand that such interpretations, if, fall, if followed to their logical conclusions, will cause scriptures to be understood in ways that they were never intended by the author. This author, Moses, writing about the days of Joseph is not thinking about what people are doing in South Africa or in China or in Australia at this particular moment in time. They're talking about the local area, but they're really talking about the whole world as they knew it, right? The world doesn't mean literally the world, but it does mean the world in the eyes of those that were around at that particular time. I'm not sure you noticed my subtext right here, but I just want to make sure that all of you noticed this little subtext here, the text, this particular text, that last segment that I read that was part of my satire piece was actually verbatim taken from the New Answers book, from Answers in Genesis, right? Where they're talking about young earth creationist apologetic, you know, where they're talking about the importance of taking Noah's flood literally in terms of like, you know, you're abandoning the authority of scripture if you don't interpret this passage in a particular way. Um, all I'm saying is if you're interpreting that passage in that way, you're going to need to also interpret Joseph's famine in the same sense because you are using the same words, right? It's the same language that's being used in the description. It's, you're using the same words. You're using the same language to describe the event of Joseph's famine and where people came from and how the whole world is affected by that, right? The face of the entire earth is affected by this famine, just like the face of the entire earth is flooded during Noah's uh, ark. Now, I may do a follow-up video to this, and that follow-up video will look at uh, a young earth creationist who seems to have taken up the mantle of this challenge, because that's pretty much what this is. This is a challenge to young earth creationists to be consistent in their hermeneutic, right? It's consistent in their form of interpretation of scripture. If you're going to read these words about earth and face of and over and covers and all these types of terms, right? And you interpret them in one way in Genesis 9 through 11 in the description of the Noahic flood, then you're also going to need to interpret those in the same form and fashion in Genesis 41. And there is one young earth creationist who seems to have taken up that mantle and that particular challenge and seems to be trying to argue a case for a global famine for all peoples, all peoples of earth coming to Egypt and saving themselves through the action of Joseph. Like no one would be crazy enough to actually think that somebody would make that argument, right? That there was a global famine and that people came from North America all the way to Egypt in order to save themselves uh, from that famine. But Nathaniel Jensen has made a stab at it. And so maybe we'll take a look at that. Uh, in some future video. For now, thanks for listening and give me some feedback. You know, do you think that this is a proper analogy comparing Genesis 41 with Genesis 9 and 10? Do you think those words are meant to be interpreted in the same fashion, um, especially if Moses is the author of both of those texts? Yeah, let's debate. Let's talk about it. So thanks for hanging out with me. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.